Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Friends Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer, and uh, apologies for those of you watching live. We are a little bit earlier than usual because uh, I have load shedding, and so <laughs> I have to move my day around. So anyway, down with load shedding, um, but that's not exactly... Uh, have we ever been sentiment. early before? No, we've we've been early before. I think once. I think there was there was that one time when we were so early accidentally because we accidentally live streamed it before the live stream was cool. I'm not going to name names or point never fingers. Never, never happened. happened. <laughs> it's a myth. It's 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 like it's like the third force. Anyway, um, that aside, uh, I'm joined, of course, today by Mr. Herman Pretorius. Herman, how are you doing? Um, I'm doing well. Uh, I'm resentful. Uh, but that's just because uh, of, of who I am as a person. But mostly um, that resentfulness has now just manifest in the fact that I have a, I'm going to take issue with you calling it load shedding. We should stop calling it load shedding. We should start calling it rolling blackouts or whatever because it is uh, – I've got a fundamental time, problem with this. Yeah, I think, at, I think at this time in the South African psyche, the phrase load shedding has just as much malice as any other phrase. Uh, uh, and, of course, we're also quite. joined today by Mr. Gabriel Krauser. Gabriel, how are you? Yeah, jolly good. Here we are, fighting another day's yeah. fight. Here we are indeed, sir. And now, before I continue on, because there have been inquiries as to this, Herman, the last time you were on the show, you had to leave early because your dog was ill. Is the yes. dog all right? The dog is all right and adorable and uh, hopefully not making too much noise in the background. I have uh, accidentally, or well, not accidentally, very lovely puppy toy thing. You take a bottle, you put some kibble in the bottle, and you cut a hole there. It keeps them busy for hours. It's a noisy few hours, but it's fun. So he's now somewhere in the house, you know, just sounding like he's breaking down the Berlin Wall. But hey, but he's good. Thanks, thanks, thanks for all the care and interest shown by the loyal daily friends. <laughs> Excellent. Right. So let us go boldly forth into the land of what's up and what's down in South Africa. And our first story is one actually from last week that we didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, but it's quite an interesting one. I wish we could have talked about it yesterday when we had Caden on the show because he has, in fact, been, I think, actually a history teacher. Um, but this is, of course, that the, the Department of Basic Education has announced that a new history curriculum will be taught at schools starting in 2024. Uh, Cheryl Weston, who's the curriculum director in the department, said that the new syllabi will be implemented in a phased approach in various grades to uh, ease into the revised history curriculum. Um, they're expecting to finalize the first draft of this curriculum by the end of this year. Um, and then they say they will do a final draft in the middle of 2022. Oh, <laughs> this is dogs making a lot of noise. <laughs> um, and uh, then it will be sent to Umalusi for quality assurance in the, in the last six months of the year for further approvals. This follows on a, um, a task team appointed by uh, Minister Angie Motreka to look into revising the history curriculum and making history a compulsory subject um, in the last few years of high school. So I think, you know, I'm a history nut. I really love history. I write a history thing every week in the Daily Friend. You should check it out. It's Week in History. And I think history is really important, um, particularly in politics, because it, it can add a lot of context to the political world in which we live. Gabriel, um, we don't have a lot of details about what this curriculum will look like yet, uh, what subjects it will take, what, what, how it's going to approach these things, what it will focus on, all that sort of stuff. What do you make of uh, this? What are the pitfalls? Is this important? What What do you make of this? Yeah, it is. I, I haven't had a chance to read the report properly. I've just read reports on the report um, and done a brief scan. The major pitfall is that basically you tell a race nationalist narrative through South African history in order to turn the concept of what it is to be a South African citizen into either a racial identity or into some sort of secondhand idea that's that's very far downstream of what really matters, and that is uh, your race group. Um, so one of the ways that you can see this uh, happening is that the story is, you know, history is being taught one way with one dominant narrative, 
And uh, this is why we need to rewrite history. This is the minister's words. And we need to rewrite history uh, in order to subvert that narrative. Now, the implied narrative uh, is one of sort of white supremacy and telling everything from a white person's point of view. It's already the case that that is not how history is being taught at schools. It was not how history was being taught at schools since the 90s, uh, not by a long shot. Uh, so if, you, if, you're, if you're saying, look, the problem is we've got too many white perspectives, uh, once you've already made the shift from an apartheid-style uh, history textbook, uh, then, then really you're in the game of, of punching at ghosts at solving a problem that's already been solved and so really creating a new problem. Uh, and I think that new problem is already afoot. So here's one example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to some students who studied history at high school, some of them at, uh, through the government curriculum, some of them through the IEC curriculum. I asked them, do you know who Non Kawuse was? Uh, she is one of the most important figures in South African history. Uh, she was Kosa, a teenager, millenarian, who said that uh, the ancestors had spoken to her on a hill one day and they had said, you must uh, drive, you must slaughter your cows, sacrifice them, burn your crops, uh, and then the ancestors will rise up and drive the white man into the sea. The Kosas at the time, uh, I think it was between the 8th and 9th Kosa Wars, uh, it, it, you know, it wasn't like the Zulus under one king or chief. There were various uh, mini city-states. Chiefdoms, yeah. uh, chiefdoms. Some agreed with non -Tawuse, some disagreed. Those who agreed... Uh, made the sacrifices, and as it turns out, no ancestors rose up, no ghosts came to uh, drive the white man to the sea. So a couple of years later, they were sitting without stock, without crop. And what did they do? They ended up robbing their neighbors. Uh, Corsa uh, chiefs invading other Corsa chiefs to steal their cattle uh, in order to basically make ends meet, otherwise they'd starve. Uh, and then what happened is that the Brits, I think under Bartle Freire, so Bartle Freire took advantage of the situation to invade uh, the, the Kosa lands uh, to keep the peace uh, as per the agreement that had been made. Uh, that was the ninth, ninth Kosa war. That was the last time that Kosas were ever independent. Uh, so Non Kawuse, right. by shooting herself in the foot, shot her people in the foot and lost their sovereignty. Uh, there's a deep lesson in that. It's an important historical yeah. moment. Anyone who has any interest in Kosa history should know that. These guys were all his interested in Kosa history. None of them knew that. Second example, very briefly, it was on Heritage Day that we were meeting, I said, how do you, do you, do you guys know how her, what Heritage Day is all about? Uh, they had no idea. They had no idea about Shaka Remembrance Day. They had no idea about the People's War. They had no idea about the IFP and the ANC clashing. Uh, they knew a little bit about the Third Force. They didn't realize that there was major actual clashes, a lot of it being driven by the ANC. No idea about the tens of thousands of innocent, non-political black people who were killed. And no idea even that the IFP wasn't going to be on the ballot until the last moment that the no, names with a sticker and that part of the deal was to draw the IFP in. They said, well, we'll keep Shaka day as a kind of uh, public holiday. We'll just rebrand it. They, but uh, Gabriel, yeah, you did leave, you did leave out the best part of the story, which is that they started the conversation by complaining that that holiday was being whitewashed. Yes. No, that is literally how they started the conversation. <laughs> so uh, they had a strong sense that South Africa was Eden. Uh, then Jan van Riebeek came, uh, no idea about Vasco da Gama. And as soon as white people arrived, it, it, it went to hell. No idea about independent Cape franchise. No idea about why Stellenbosch is named after a non-white person, uh, one of this country's crown jewels in terms of beauty and uh, lucrative excellence. No, no idea about the complicated nature of our history. Uh, and that's what they got from the South African school system. And that's the version that's not good enough. Now it has to be more uh, race nationalist, decolonized. And frankly, I think that... Uh, um, it would be a very good idea uh, to adjust our history curriculum um, and for South Africans to learn about where we've come from. Uh, but I don't think that my sense of how that ought to be executed is at all overlapping with the ministers. Mm, no, I, I think that's very likely. Um, yeah, I, I just want to say that I think that it's to to truly un understand, you know, what it is to be a South African, we have to understand the really messy crazy wild complicated past that we had and it really is an interesting one that um despite all of the political narratives that have tried to make it very simple um from various perspectives i think uh, it's a fascinating story when told in all of its depth complexity and confusingness um because it's just it's just interesting anyway 
Herman, your thoughts on this? Um, what what would you do? You agree with what Gabriel would put in the curriculum? What what would you put in the curriculum if you were made Lord High Emperor of Education for a year? I mean, don't tempt me, Frodo. Um, no, I, I think um, I, I don't really disagree with anything Gabriel has said. I just think that there's this real tragedy of history repeating itself. Um, I mean, but if uh, race nationalist gone a race national late, um, the, the National Party did exactly this. Uh, I mean, for, for the dominant part of the 20th century, my, my dad's a retired professor in history, and, and I've spoken to him a lot about the politicization of history because his, his field is, is very much, you know, Africana history, the Anglo-Boer War. And then people always expect him to, uh, because he's, that's his field, they expect him to, to politicize the field. Um, as the um, nationalist, Afrikaner nationalist historians of the 20th century did. And then they find out that he's one of the most apolitical people, uh, you know, on, on, on the face of the planet. Um, he's politically active, but um, he's, I don't even know quite his ideology where he sits. And I think that's part of what, why he's a good historian is he, he investigates uh, the facts. He tries to find the facts and tries to find the currents of narrative and thinking and events that led to the formation of the world as we know it uh, from the past. But the problem is the Afrikaner nationalist historians um, uh, just allowed politics to inform every aspect of their research. I mean, someone like Albert Grindlin, um was uh, discouraged, in fact, blacklisted in many ways by the, the South African academic sphere of the Afghan nationalist heyday for daring to investigate historical things like um, uh, the, 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 the Hensoppers and the Joiners during the Anglo-Boer War. The, the, the political narrative was such that, no, that, that is an area of history that ought not to be touched. There is nothing to be said for the Volksverreier who, who uh, Hensopt or joined. So that is not a worthy, a meritorious, a, a, a noble pursuit of historical inquiry. Now, the problem is that once you get politics into the research of events, you can't get to the truth, really, because your goal is no longer truth seeking or truth telling. Um, it is narrative seeking and agenda telling where you want to uh, uh, weaponize certain events uh, so as to antagonize or praise whatever uh, concentration of power you might be proud of or opposed to. So this isn't a uniquely ANC bit of stupidity. This is something that um, the ANC pretty much inherited just like they inherited the you know, weird form of, of uh, moral conservatism through the ballot box from the National Party. Um, and it is really a tragedy because we have just now in the last 30 years, historiography and historical research has made great strides to move away from the nationalist dominance that, that plagued it right up until the late 70s, even the mid 80s. So now to do a 180 and repoliticize history rather than continue down the path of depoliticization as proper historians should, is just so tragic because you can't trust, just like you couldn't trust the National Party to give a fair representation of history leading to its current political dominance, you can't trust the ANC to do the same. If the syllabus reform was driven by non-political people, and I'm not putting anyone forward, but hint, hint, dad, you might be good at this, um, then we could actually look at a pretty good curriculum that has representative features that looks at the various historical traditions, because we have to be honest about the fact that written history is not superior to oral history, but it is perhaps more reliable. So there needs to be more work done on oral history. That means African history has been underrepresented in many ways. So, so there is reform to be had and there is reform to be done exactly the points that Gabriel made. Sadly, we're not going to get that sort of motivation, that sort of leadership and that sort of integrity uh, from the ANC and Andy Moteka and I doubt from any government, any state, anywhere. I really think that this is where parents and, and you know, non governmental uh, uh, persons could step in to fill this void and say, you know, let's give it a fair shot to teach history as it actually is, because there is something to be said for the skewing of history historically, but also 
in the present and from 2024 onwards. No, well said. And I, uh, I, I'm sure that our sort of sister branch of the IRR family, um, which is called Edonti, Educate, Don't Indoctrinate, uh, we'll keep an eye on this. And I'm sure uh, when the curriculum actually comes out, we'll have more to say on it um, and, and what might be in it. Um, but that's, yeah, that's for next year and, uh, and later this year. Anyway, let us move on to... I'm doing free advertising for oh, yes. <laughs> one of the best South African history books. Yes, it's uh, uh, that's a really good book, but difficult to read. So you're going to have to put aside a lot of time if you want to. And just and just a, a sort of pin anecdote, you know, how stupid the sort of Afrikaner political nationalist historians were that Pirniev, the grand iconographer um, of, uh, of Afrikaner uh, something vision of, of South African landscapes oh, was probably. excised. Uh, because he made he delivered historical lectures or lectures on um, the history and aesthetic merits of uh, care paintings by Bushman, and so then they said, "No, we're going to cancel your contract and no more painting for the Foot Tracker Monument, and we don't, we will, you got cancelled, we'll deplatform, de disinvited." <laughs> stupid. <laughs> it's just stupid. Repeats itself, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I it's know. it's 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 like the Book of Ecclesiastes. There is nothing new under the sun. Um, it really is just uh, history. I think it's Twain who said history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Very much so. Um, we must be careful talking about history on the Dirty French Show because then <laughs> we can't contain ourselves. <laughs> um, the anyway, three of us especially. On. Yeah, no, especially the three of us. Um, <laughs> but let us move on to a story that I don't know how much uh, there is in terms of analysis to be done, but it is still definitely worth talking about. Especially in contrast to the sort of other stories that have dominated the headlines. Um, so this is a tale from South Africa's wild east. And that is that uh, Mpumalanga MEC for Agriculture, Rural Development, Land and Environmental Affairs um, has been charged with a double murder. So Mandla Nsibi uh, was, uh, is accused by police and has been charged with murdering two ANC, senior ANC members who were at a meeting with him. Apparently, they went to a, a nearby Chisanyama and the police alleged that he shot them dead there. They were apparently um, taking a break from a meeting to discuss ANC candidate lists in the province. Uh, the MEC has denied these charges. He handed himself over to police yesterday. He said he was with his bodyguard at the time, went to the Chisunyama, he heard shots, his bodyguard evacuated him from the building, and he had absolutely nothing to do with the murder, and that this was all a political plot where the police are being used as thugs to enforce some ANC faction's uh, uh, agenda. So uh, he appeared in the, the magistrate's court and he's applied for bail, um, and obviously the case is going to continue forward from here. We'll, I'm sure we'll find out more in coming months, but who, uh, you know, on both versions of the story here, it's not great. Uh, if the MEC is right, the police in Mpumalanga have been so completely politicized that they are able to drag a senior member of government off to jail on trumped up political charges. And if the police are right, a senior ANC politician shot people, two people dead in a public place with lots of witnesses, which is also crazy. So, I don't know. Uh, uh, let me start with you again, Gabriel. What are we supposed to make of this madness? Yeah, I remember coming across a similar story involving the Newcastle mayor and some of his senior apparatchiks uh, and uh, a murder of a key state witness who uh, was about to come forward and testify against him in front of an ATM in the middle of Newcastle and sort of spoke to people with there and said, you know, there's, there's just no way as I'm going on the record or going in front of a court. We all know what happened. Um, the UCT found 90 ANC people killed around the 2016 election, sort of 2016, 2017. Um, that number has started to climb down, uh, but it's still significant. The story is far from the only one. We've had quite a few murders related to candidate lists and ANC internal politics this year. It's, uh, interesting. There was a New York times report where, uh, they spoke to an ANC whistleblower who uh, sort of his friend had been shot and he was in hiding and he said the ANC has become the mafia 
And what we did is we broke omerta, which is a very fancy sort of word for like rural dudes in KZN to be using. But it's a sign that we do watch our movies and we know about the sort of mafia code of silence and you, and you never tell on it's nothing worse than being a, a rat. Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty grim. I think that uh, in a way, the hope is that the ANC evolves to the point where less people are assassinating each other to get candidate roles. Uh, that, that would sort of be the new dawn. Um, and, and I think that if this was something like communist China, that would be a genuine aspiration. You know, let's get behind the guys who are going for 10 assassination nations per election cycle rather than 90. Uh, that would seem like real progress. Um, we're in a multi-party system, so it turns out you can just vote people out uh, who are stuck in that viper's nest. Uh, we, I hope South Africans consider the options. Mm, although I must say, it probably doesn't do great for the confidence of voters in Mpumalanga when their politicians are all killing each other. You might start to wonder... Maybe it's not just each other that they're going to be turning their guns on. Maybe it's us too. I don't know. Um, Armand, what do you make of this? You recently expressed to me concern about uh, rising political violence. Yeah, no, I think I think Gabriel's point about manageable levels of political murder is actually, you know, tragically prescient. Um, the thing is, and, and this is just a constant fear I have, and, and that's why especially the assassination of Babita Diokaram was quite worrisome. Um, and uh, one, one should be careful not to read um, narrative or pattern into reported incidents. Um, and then I think Gabriel is right to, to point out that five, five years ago, there were almost triple figures of, of political, uh, politically motivated deaths. And where I don't think uh, we, we are near those levels uh, currently. But what makes me uneasy about the about any any sort of political murder is um, it's essentially, in my understanding, driven by two things, opportunism um, and uh, uh, territoriality, um, in the sense that you either have and want to protect your territory, your domain, or you are opportunistic and you think that in removing um, A, B, or C, it will ease your progress through the ranks. Um, and as has often been said by the Institute, um, uh, big leagues like, um, like Anthea, Jeffrey, and, and, and France, uh, the patronage network is, is very real. The, the ANC's patronage network isn't, isn't a byproduct. It is absolutely the nervous system of, of how the entity still functions. Now, the problem is with a state increasingly bankrupt, a party dependent on patronage increasingly desperate, um, it, 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 it ups the ante in both opportunism and this protection of territoriality or this territory and, 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 and the territorialness of, 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 of the beast. Combine that with the fact that the ANC um, has its birth um, or let's, let's say it's, it's adolescence in illegality and criminality outside of the system, whether that system is, you know, was just or not. The point is that the ANC went through its adolescence quite keenly, um, unlawfully, against the law as it was. Not necessarily unjustly, that's a whole different concept, I'm not touching that, but it operated outside of the bounds of the law. You throw those three ingredients, the um, outside law uh, functionality of the ANC, the opportunism, the territorial protection, uh, and, and then the fourth ingredient, uh, ingredient of, of um, you know, diminishing returns in terms of ANC membership and trying to move your way up in the patronage system. And you really end up in a very, very dangerous situation where the carcass has been pecked dry. Um, so the animals still scavenging around it become more desperate and more violent. Uh, that's my fear. I don't know if this is the case, but I do think we ought to remember that... Um, Pumalanga is perhaps underreported in its notoriousness for political violence, but our deputy president um, is someone who is seriously um, connected, not spuriously or by rumor, with some claim of substance connected to political violence and the odd political murder. Um, and the, 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 the geist of David Mabuza might still very much be informing the political uh, culture of that province. 
Um, and, and that is why these things always, you know, it, it scratches a, a, a scab of South African politics that I really, really fear might turn into full-on bleeding. It's just the desperation of this. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's more narrative fear than, than uh, data analysis. So apologies for that. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, the Mpumalanga's reputation as a place where kind of mafioso-like bad things happen, I think has been established for a while. I remember watching some sort of South African comedy, political comedy thing, and I think it was 2013, 2014, somewhere around there. And uh, the the comedian was making jokes about how, you know, in Mpumalanga, you know, you do what you're told or else bad things happen to you. Um, and... Oh boy, is this kind of this case here showing that that's uh, very much still the case? And if anything, it seems to be, as I've said before on the show, bleeding out into the other provinces. And Nick, just just a quick point to pick up on your introduction is compare this um, to a poster. I mean, let, let's not get dragged him down onto the poster <laughs> debate. Let's move on to the next topic. But <laughs> the, the 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 I fact the. The fact of the the the, the short no, the shortcomings of one political no. party is bad campaigning and bad messaging, where the shortcomings of another party is you know assassinating its own members. <laughs> it does just cut to the heart of the ridiculousness of of, of, of political coverage. Yeah, South Africa can sometimes be a bit of a silly place. Anyway, um, so very briefly, we're just going to cover our last story. Not very much in depth here. Um, there's a new piece of legislation currently in the pipeline, the Draft Companies Amendment Bill. And uh, the head of business leadership South Africa, Busi Mvaso, um, Mvuso, has said that uh, this is a terrible piece of legislation because it's going to add yet more regulations and compliance requirements to foreign investors and to local uh, companies. Um, it's got a whole bunch of stuff in it, but one of the things that kind of uh, annoys business people is that it... Uh, will require all listed companies to disclose the ratio of top pay to bottom paid 5% of workers, um, a requirement to identify shareholders who are the true and beneficial owners of shares in a company and other stuff too, just to kind of, uh, uh, yeah, just basically these are kind of socialist things to say, you know, these are the people who are earning all the money and uh, this is how unequal the company is in its terms of its pay, that kind of stuff. And the, the fear is that a lot of companies, which right now are looking with a skeptical eye, South Africa will say, yeah, well, we don't have to do that in Mauritius. We don't have to do that in India. We don't have to do that in Australia. Herman, uh, in yeah. seconds, what do you make of this? Um, I, I've got some, ironically enough, some sympathy for the idea that pay disclosure should be, you know, something that could be done. I've got some problems with it being state mandated, but I do think that there is a very real um inequality uh, issue um perhaps driven by uh, a very cozy relationship between uh, business leadership and government um so so i'm all for 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 shining light there i do think however that that is something that the state should not become involved in um that is something that could be more uh, social activism uh where people can say you know uh, this company um, does this, that company does not do that, inform the consumer to decide, right, do I want to support a company with this pay differential rather than that pay differential? So that's one thing I've got some sympathy for for that view. On the other hand, I really don't care um, what the richest of the rich earn. Um, I think, and I've said this before, that if your main concern is the distance between rich and poor uh, uh, rather than the distance between poor and the bread line, then you're part of the problem and not the solution. Uh, let, to, to, to quote Peter Mandelson, a, a Blairite Labour uh, minister, is I, in, in a way, I don't care if people get filthy rich. It's the filth of poor, of, of, it's the filth of poverty that, that, that really should keep us up at now. Gabriel, uh, in 30 seconds or so, your thoughts? Yeah, the end user identif uh, identification of beneficent ownership is, I think, a more serious challenge. Government already discloses the ratio between the top 5% and the bottom 5%. It doesn't make a difference. Um, the The real thing is forcing people uh, to, identif to identify shareholders. I think that that could be very useful myself. Um, I think as a sort of global matter... Um, 
Uh, this is connected with, uh, you can check out a piece on the Daily Friend by Ivo Fachter, the sort of OECD plus plus agreement of 136 countries to set a minimum corporate tax rate of 15%. Doesn't affect South Africa. Our corporate tax rate is much higher than that, more than double. Um, but it is part of a global uh, sort of coordinated effort between governments to stop tax evasion and to uh, get the connection between sort of massive corporates and the obligations to citizens aligned. Um, I think that it's complicated, it's open to abuse, but that it's also necessary uh, for, for global relations to work out properly, for there to be transparency. In South Africa, taxes get so badly wasted that one is very sympathetic towards those who would rather not pay any taxes at all. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't actually solve the problem by tax evasion. We solve the problem by changing the <laughs> rules. And so uh, Busa yeah. and uh, uh, Busima Busa, the head of business leaders, uh, business leaders for South Africa, I think he's barking up the wrong tree a little bit here. This is something mm. to defend because big business is going to like it and people who really hate paying taxes are going to like it. Uh, I wish he had focused his energy on going after the things that are really killing jobs. Yes. For example, yes. no yes. importing of cement, which is going to hike prices on construction. There's a mafia industry already. BE uh -huh. is a complete nightmare. NHI is going to drive out the middle class. EWC just uh -huh. blows up dynamite underneath every asset in the country. Uh, let's focus on that. Let's tackle that. Let's get it right. Well said, sir. Anyway, that's yeah, all the time yeah. we have for today. Thank you very much for listening. Um, please support the Institute of Race Relations, which is the uh, dark force behind the Daily Friend show. You can SMS Third me force. Two, three, two, eight, two, three. Uh, and we'll call you back to sign up as a friend of the Institute. Anyway, uh, have a wonderful day, everyone, and we will see you tomorrow. Cheers. Mm -hmm.